First of all, hello. Good morning. Buenos dias. Anyoha seo. Thank you for joining us this midwinter day or midsummer if you're down in the south. Um, this is probably our most international event to date. Um, as you know, we focus uh, quite heavily on our New York and North American market here at Columbia. Uh, we're quite excited about today's seminar, and we hope to roll out a series of these seminars over the coming months and over the coming year. Some quick housekeeping, uh, and apologize for repeating myself, but we do want to encourage our audience to participate. And to the extent that you have questions, feel free to throw it in the Q&A box. Uh, we're exploring the ability to enable the chat so you can chat with each other. Um, and also, this webinar is being recorded, and we'll make it available to the general public in the next day or two. Um, this is something that we do for all of our webinars and discussions, and to the extent that you have further interest, feel free to visit our website and look at some of the past events. So as an institution, Columbia University has always been an active global citizen, engaged in not only developing and training young minds, young faculty and researchers, but also taking on some of the grand challenges of their day by carrying out the fundamental research and encouraging important dialogues, investing in basic ideas of knowledge transfer, uh, and sharing findings and sharing and extrapolating some of these into applications in the real world. Here at the Construction Administration Program and at the School of Professional Studies, we're especially proud of that legacy, where we focus on catalyzing theory and principles, practice and ethics, and convening scholars and practitioners to assess and advance the training and development of our primary stakeholders, our students, our local and global community, and really anyone that cares to tune in. There are many, many grand challenges today. Perhaps there have always been grand challenges. Today in our immediate reality is the global pandemic and its repercussions are probably the greatest challenge. And many would say that we either have failed or barely got a passing grade in how we responded to it as a global community. But further out and with a longer range in sight, I want to draw your attention to what the UN has designated as their grand challenges, mainly climate change and inequality. And grand challenges because they'll fundamentally, fundamentally provide headwinds for how we move forward as a society, as an economy, and really as a global community. Over the years, I've had the pleasure to play a small part in some of these endeavors and have had an even greater pleasure to meet and work with others who have gone further and done more in this arena than I could have hoped for. Today, we're especially honored to be hosting the Global Infrastructure Hub and what we believe is an important part of how we're going to be addressing the social, environmental, and economic challenges we face on a go forward basis, specifically post-pandemic. The built environment and infrastructure has played and will continue to play an important role in enabling and also potentially disabling our social economic activities, our well-being, equality, fairness, advancement, and sadly, to a great deal, much of this has been politicized. Behind the veneer of infrastructure's advancement, there's always been a world of semi-functional or even dysfunctional politics, amplified often by an unclear allocation of responsibilities between international and intranational levels of government. And on top of that, we may not even have a good common agreement of what infrastructure is, nor how we might be able to ambitiously reimagine what it could be. Today's conversation and tagline was meant to be slightly provocative, was, is there a future for infrastructure mega projects? And I hope that through this discussion, we might glean some of these answers or at least explore newer questions. With that, I want to introduce Henri Bla. Henri serves as a chief content officer for the Global Infrastructure Hub. He has an exceptional background at the intersection of infrastructure and policy and economics. He worked at AECOM and more recently had leadership roles with the 100 Resilient Cities Project initiated by the Rockefeller Foundation. And although that was a $100 million project, you could argue it certainly was a mega project in scope and impact. More importantly, more importantly, having done graduate work in transportation and infrastructure at NYU, he is a New Yorker. And despite being at Columbia, I'm a big fan of NYU and my friends over at the engineering department. So Henri, I think you've been spotlighted. Let me look at you, there you are. Let me start off. Can you give us a quick introduction to you, your work and the Global Infrastructure Hub? 
Thanks so much, Francisco, for the for the introduction. And hi, everyone. Very excited to be uh, to be here with um, we love you tonight from uh, from a wide variety of country, from what I understand. So thanks a lot again to Colombia for um, organizing this um, the, the, this event. Um, so as Francisco was saying, my name is Henry Blast. I'm the Chief Content Officer at the uh, Infrastructure Hub. Uh, kind of mean that I'm looking at uh, anything sort of uh, related to um, uh, to like delivery and, uh, and sort of uh, te technical stuff. Uh, let, let's go it this way at the at the hub. So uh, I guess first of all, I will start with what is what is the hub. So the GI hub is actually at, um, it's a dedicated infrastructure entity of the G20. It was established in 2014. So we are that makes us officially six years old. Uh, and our mission is really to support the G20 agenda uh, to develop sustainable, resilient, and inclusive infrastructure. Um, and we do that through evidence and practice sharing with a particular focus on infrastructure finance uh, because we, we we work directly with the finance ministers and, uh, and the central bank governors uh, under the G20. So as an organization, our priorities are clearly aligned with the, with the G20. Uh, and I just, um, I just go, go through uh, the, the, the top three, uh, just, uh, just, just as an introduction. The first one is what we call infrastructure as an asset class. That's a big word that essentially just talk about the, um, the idea of taking pressure off government budgets through increased private sector participation. Um, the second one, which is uh, equally important, is quality infrastructure investment. So obviously the G20 wants more investment in infrastructure, but we want quality. Uh, and I think that's something that's shared across all the different countries. And that's, so that means supporting sustainable, resilient, and increasing outcomes through quality infrastructure investment. Uh, the, the, the last one, which was last year priority uh, under the G20, is around Infotech, which is around the idea of leveraging technology to reduce costs, build in resilience, improve outcomes, et cetera, uh, again, so merging technology and infrastructure. So those, those are kind of like the three priority uh, until this year. So this year is led by, by Italy. Um, they are the presidency of the, um, of the G20. They've got a very ambitious agenda uh, that will obviously be a little bit, you know, has been a little bit hijacked by the, the G20, uh, the, sorry, the COVID, uh, the COVID recovery. So the focus for infrastructure uh, will be to really ensuring what we call a transformative recovery from the COVID crisis through infrastructure. Uh, so the idea is to, through infrastructure, deliver transformative outcomes and create more resilience and better maintenance for assets going forward, uh, like we, we've learned from the, from the existing crisis. Uh, so that's kind of like our overall priority. And the way we do this is uh, at the core is, is through partnerships. Uh, and that's really, that's really core to our approach. And, um, and, and that's, uh, that's why it's the, 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 the report that is at the base of that, um, uh, of that discussion today, uh, the future of, uh, of infrastructure was delivered in collaboration with the World Economic Forum. And today, obviously, we're very excited to, to share that, uh, the platform with, um, uh, with Columbia University. Uh, so I think I'll stop there in terms of uh, broad introduction as to who we are. Fantastic. Thank you, Henri. That's, so that leads to the next quick question. And I'm looking at one of your outtake reports here where private investment has come down from 100 billion to 156 billion in the last nine years. And particularly worrisome is that the social infrastructure investment uh, has come down from roughly 20 billion in 2010 to 3 billion uh, in 2019. So maybe that sort of uh, introduces this next question, which is, you know, is there a change needed in the way government approach infrastructure, both at the G20 and maybe more broadly as well? So I, I think there's, uh, it's probably not so much of a change as, a, as, a, as an evolution. Um, the, the way government industry approaches procurement uh, need to evolve and better adapt to the, uh, I guess, to the market, to the projects and, and the community. Uh, but I think more topically this year and uh, end of last, I mean, last year as well, uh, sort of react to the to the COVID crisis and the need for uh, for recovery, an economic recovery, local job recovery, etc. And that's really at the core of what the G20 is trying is trying to do uh, trying to do this year. Uh, what we what we've seen is that infrastructure is, a, is an important enabler for economic growth over the the short and, and long term. Uh, and uh, so public investment in that sector could really have significant impact for the rest of the economy. In fact, we, we found out through, um, through meta-analysis of, uh, of uh, more than, uh, than 5,000 projects uh, that, that actually the GDP multiplier, so the impact of investment in infrastructure from the government was actually much higher than any form other of public spending. So that, I think that's what governments are 
uh, current, I mean, the, the, the government is lucky enough to, to sort of start being able to look at recovery uh, and not mitigation of the, of the crisis. Are we looking at infrastructure as a way to basically create that, that recovery? So to do this and to, to go back to your, um, to, 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 to your question around, is there different way to, to basically look at it, look at infrastructure. Um, I think there are key challenges uh, that, that need to be addressed uh, so that you know infrastructure can actually achieve this, those transformative outcomes. Uh, and uh, one that we, we, we are talking about today is the way in which infrastructure projects are being delivered. Uh, so, so again, today's project uh, contracts sometimes can be too rigid uh, over the long term in, in the fast and uncertainty, and you have obviously new, new crisis sort of coming up, coming up every day uh, as a result of uh, you know climate change, uh, you know, and other sort of um, t- type of challenges. Uh, on top of that, we also have technological changes that that are happening faster today than than in uh, than, than in the past history. So, as a result, it's actually fairly fairly hard for governments to basically. Uh, in you know sort of uh, grasp all those changes and incorporate them into into projects. So that's where more flexibility uh, is really is really important. Um, and so governments are really, I think, increasingly looking uh, to procure outcomes rather than things. Uh, and the private sector is also increasingly involved in delivering those uh, these outcomes. So it's a kind of a, a change from government procuring thing to government procuring outcomes in partnership with the private sector. Now, to your point, the investment uh, with the private sector has actually kind of um, kind of kind of gone down, uh, unfortunately, over the over the past decade or so. Uh, and so there is uh, there's, there's obviously opportunities to uh, to incorporate more innovation and to learn from the successes uh, that uh, that uh, that exist around the world. So we we believe that there are already a lot of the solutions, and we've seen them. Uh, but there's actually very limited awareness of them across different countries. Usually. Usually people know what, what has happened in their city over the past, uh, you know, five, 10 years, uh, but actually sort of missing out great innovation in the way you could actually integrate uh, all those different elements into project delivery um, across, across, across the world. So that's why we started uh, last year and we're going to continue this year. Uh, there's actually a request from the, um, uh, from the presidency of G20 to, to identify and share case studies of innovation around funding and financing uh, including maintenance, etc., uh, to and delivery models uh, to basically be able to share those innovations and and to and to you know uh, help government integrate all those different outcomes. Uh, so I'm really obviously looking really looking forward to the discussion later on uh, because I'm sure our speakers tonight will share some of those um, interesting examples of mega projects where they've they've managed to sort of um, uh, incorporate some of those uh, new um, uh, new needs, I guess. So, all right, some interesting points you brought up and leads to my, my, my last question for you, which is what would success look like arising from this, this engagement, this process, this research that, that you know, you're undertaking and that others are undertaking. You mentioned the multiplier effect and, and we know that in recessionary environments, that multiplier effect is even greater. Um, um, and the other thing I would add to that too is from you know, understanding the metrics and understanding kind of the infrastructure technology and just monitoring technologies, perhaps even getting closer to understanding of what that impact looks like. You know, traditionally, economic uh, statisticians have accounted for only five or six, maybe seven percent, up to eight or nine percent of GDP uh, contribution from the sector uh, in, in developing economies. But uh, there's some interesting research in the UK and elsewhere, including my belief that the role of construction, the role of infrastructure, the role of uh, you know, the participation of the built environment in the economy is far greater than that six, seven, eight, nine percent, maybe 20, 22 percent even. So, you know, not just from an economic impact standpoint, but just also broader, what does that success look like uh, for you and, and, and you know, and, and maybe the group that you represent and others? No, absolutely. I mean, infrastructure is and, and has always been, uh, I mean, a key enabler for economic activity. And I think we've seen the importance of the of the health and the digital infrastructure in this COVID crisis. Um, so I, I think that, uh, I mean, the, the, the percentage of impact is, 
is uh, is, is obviously always kind of uh, you know difficult to you know, to pinpoint an actual number because infrastructure kind of support uh, you know you could say pretty much everything everything we do. Uh, so I think the numbers that was uh, that I was sort of mentioning are around the return on investment from a government perspective, uh, and I think that's where we're seeing a lot of opportunities uh, and a lot of appetite, I, I guess, from the government end to be like, oh, well, that that might actually be the way for me uh, as a, as a government to get out of that crisis recover strongly uh, and, and what the government are facing, not not facing, but what the government have to integrate is people actually, even though COVID is there, actually asking for a lot more resilience, sustainability and inclusiveness within those projects. Uh, so that's kind of like the um, the conundrum that, you know, where most governments are at the moment, they got all those sort of pressing needs and they need to integrate that into great infrastructure projects such as uh, such as being a project. So I think what, what we can, we can, what we're hoping to achieve and what the G20 is, is hoping to achieve, um, there's obviously a lot of a lot of different things, uh, but maybe for tonight, I'll, I'll just focus on the uh, on the efficiency. I mean, there's obviously the outcomes and the transformative elements of project is very critical, uh, but I think delivering efficiency is, is also fairly important. I mean, the debt level across the, the, the G20 and all the other countries are obviously going up because of the, of the crisis. So there's more and more pressure on government to not only achieve more, but also with less. Um, and so I think this is kind of central to the G20, um, uh, yeah, G20, G20 agenda uh, this year as well uh, in helping sort of government uh, and I, after that when, when it comes to delivering a project to make them more efficient. Um, I mean, to be numbers, the IMF released um, a recent report where they were saying that, um, that, that actually 33 or like a third of the resources are lost in the public investment process on average. So essentially, uh, even before the construction, uh, we're actually losing a lot of resources in trying to get those projects together. Uh, and that's part of like the delivery. And that, 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 um, that, that number is obviously very high because you can imagine everything that you could do with this. And we believe that those, uh, I mean, on top of that, you have cost overruns. But they just, I mean, obviously multiple reasons for this, but I think government capacity and the lack of, uh, awareness of innovation or experiences in other places is really one that we're trying to address through, through knowledge sharing and through, um, uh, through discussion like, um, like tonight. Uh, so there's definitely a potential to make, I guess, every government dollar uh, go further uh, by sort of incorporating those, uh, those new innovation and try to sort of reduce that, uh, uh, I guess, the amount of energy uh, and, and, and dollars that sort of spent in preparing those, those, those projects and then, then they fail. Uh, the last point, obviously, is try to get the private sector more involved as well. Uh, so it's gone down over the past, but uh, I think it's this clear appetite from the private sector to invest in infrastructure. And we've seen that through secondary markets where the, the activity level are actually much higher than it were 10 years ago. So there's definitely an appetite there. What, what we need is essentially cut through project complexity, getting the right allocation of risk um, so that we get the, the, you know, the pipeline of viable projects whether they actually ultimately are financed by private sector is, is almost like a secondary question. Uh, and once we get there, uh, I think there's a lot, of, um, a lot of appetite from government and private sector to actually deliver them. Uh, but we just need to get them right. And that's where well-structured mega projects are actually part of the solution. And that's why I'm very excited to sort of hear the experience and the, uh, you know, the ideas that, will, that could actually emerge from, uh, from our discussion. Fantastic. Henri, thank you very much for that. And I think that uh, is my cue to hand it over to John uh, Parker, uh, John Parkinson, my friend and my faculty at the uh, Columbia University uh, Master's Program of Construction Administration. John, you know, I like to talk a lot. Uh, so I'm just going to sort of provocate here a little bit in uh, honor of our title. There's a great article written in Eon Magazine uh, by a University of Bristol professor, Martin Parker. Uh, and he wrote about where did the grandeur go? To tie that in with Henri's comments about is infrastructure, um, is a new infrastructure delivery model really this mega project model and what does that procurement and financing and structuring look like? He wrote, going to the moon made little sense after all. It was criticized then and since as a monumental distraction from the problems of the earth and a subsidy for the military industrial complex. So John, I will leave that with you and uh, let you figure it out with uh, the rest of our friends. 
Great, thanks so much, Francisco, and um, thank you, um, Henri, for uh, for sharing your thoughts um, about uh, not only about the activities um, that in which the Global Infrastructure Hub um, is engaged on behalf of the G20, um, but uh, but but your look at infrastructure um, both as an asset class and uh, and a, as a mechanism uh, for channeling um, the funding and financing um, that's out there to support um, all of the economic revitalization activities that are necessary to, uh, to, to try and restore some sense of normalcy um, in a, in a post-pandemic world um, and help us get through that. Um, so with that, you know, the, the idea of, you know, is there a future for infrastructure mega projects? Uh, you know, we, we're going to delve into that with the, uh, with the panelists that we've assembled um, today for, uh, for the purposes of this discussion. Um, I'll introduce them briefly now, and then they'll each have an opportunity uh, to, to jump in um, with, uh, you know, with some responses to some of these questions that we have that are, that are driven by um, the conversation that uh, Francisco um, and Henri um, have just had. So we'll have um, with us today, Eve Michelle, um, who is Senior Vice President of Development and the Chief Architect of the MTA Capital Construction um, Corp here in, uh, in, the, in the US and specifically in New York City, um, supporting the uh, regional transportation network um, you know, that, is the, uh, that is the MTA. Uh, Patrick Askew, Executive Vice President with McKissick and McKissick, uh, Deputy Director, of new Terminal One at uh, JFK International Airport um, in the pro, uh, program management uh, organization um, there at NTO. Um, Antonio Roig, uh, Global Business Development Director for Asiona. Uh, Daniel Lashikov, um, though listed as independent consultant, is um, you know clearly has a, a, a broader perspective and deeper set of experiences to bring uh, to the table, and we're looking forward to. Um, his thoughts on many of the, 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 all of the panelists' thoughts on many of the questions that, um, that were raised during the, uh, the conversation, again, um, between Francisco um, and Henry. So again, I'm John Parkinson, um, faculty in the Master's of Science in Construction Administration program um, here at Columbia um, University. Uh, so the infrastructure industry continually evolves um, to meet new trends and imperatives like new technology, greater sustainability, resilience, and social impact. All of this while managing an increasing set of project risks and an understanding of what those risks are. In recent years, there's been a rise of multi-billion dollar infrastructure projects, as we've been referring to them as mega projects. As we look toward a period of post-pandemic recovery, it's timely to ask whether there is sufficient payoff for the increased risk and uncertainty associated with the complexity of these large scale projects. Uh, globally, uh, the New York region is amongst the most dynamic markets uh, for mega projects, a leader in infrastructure finance and investment. It also has a large and diverse concentration of project participation participants across all sectors. Other political considerations aside, this has certainly been a tumultuous four years for the possibilities of insurance and infrastructure investment in the United States. Around the world, as um, Henri has highlighted, there have been systemic changes to the way members of the G20 have prioritized and indeed planned for significant investments in much needed infrastructure um, development and delivery, as well as ongoing operations and maintenance for legacy systems. This is true across a broad range uh, or diverse range of infrastructure asset types. It, it's, more, it's, more, it's about more than roads, bridges, and tunnels. It also includes energy, renewables, wind, and solar, um, as well as water and wastewater treatment systems, airports, seaports, and commercial logistics needs. Um, there are still needs in the transit sector as well. They all involve both new greenfield um, development, as well as upgrades and capacity expansion to existing assets or brownfield opportunities. Mega projects include many asset classes, here in the US, in the state of Maryland, the Department of Transportation has an active procurement for a managed lanes or high occupancy um, toll lanes conversion to segments of the Capitol Beltway and the interstate or I-270 um, corridor. This is forecast to be a multi-billion dollar, multiple decades long relationship. So too are there projects in the works in the state of Georgia and North Carolina for broadband. Uh, Georgia has its own um, transportation infrastructure uh, needs, you know, 
using some creative uh, financing um, associated with a design build model going forward, which we'll be talking about a little bit more um, as, as, we, as we look ahead. So too are their transportation needs um, in the state of Mississippi, um, P3 uh, public private partnership involving, um, you know, a certain bridge, uh, Miami Dade, um, a Carter link um, in, a, in a light rail solution, New Jersey Transit, the Port Authority has its own um, needs, um, as we'll be talking about in the context of airports, but so too involving uh, Penn Station, the bus terminal, convention centers in Denver and Hawaii, data centers, fiber optics, transportation needs in, uh, in across the state of California and around Los Angeles in anticipation of the Summer Olympics coming in 2028. Um, lots of exciting projects um, that are out there. All of these that are planned or in procurement seem to align with the principles outlined by the Global Infrastructure Hub. We'll include in the, in, in the um, chat a link to the, um, to the futures uh, report that was uh, recently produced uh, by the Global Infrastructure Hub. Um, they outline uh, the imperatives for promoting quality infrastructure investment um, in infrastructure. You know, the aim of pursuing quality infrastructure investment is to maximize the positive, and I'm reading now a uh, quick summary from them, um, is to maximize the positive economic, environmental, social, and development impact of infrastructure and create a virtuous circle of economic activities while ensuring sound public finances. This can result in better allocation of resources, enhanced cap capacities, skills upgrade, and improvement of productivity for local economies. This will fa would facilitate trade, investment, and economic development. All these expected outcomes of the investment should be considered in the project design and planning. A lot of interconnected uh, components here, devastated by the pandemic, the economy and the and jobs in particular. I think there are 10 million less people employed now um, in the United States than there were this time last year, direct result of, of COVID. Um, so infrastructure investments and sound, um, sound investments and economic policies around um, those infrastructure investments, um, you know, are a key, not unlike the WPA efforts, you know, looking back to the, um, the recovery from the Great Depression. You know, and, and oftentimes in the infrastructure space, you know, we talk about P3s and other innovative project delivery methods. You know, we talk about jobs, direct, indirect, and induced job growth, um, and the, the local and regional economic redevelopment associated with those. So let's jump in and explore the future of mega projects. So again, for, for our panelists, um, Antonio, um, Eve, uh, Patrick, and Daniel, um, we're gonna go through a couple of questions um, We'll start out um, here, Antonio, with you and, and say, what, what traditionally has been the case for mega projects and, and how has this evolved in recent years? So first of all, um, um, hi, everybody. Thanks uh, uh, to uh, Columbia University and the Yale Hub for, for your invitation. And just to go uh, straight into your uh, question, John, uh, Actually, I think the, the original case of a mega project is actually the, the, the need of the project itself, right? Whether it is a new subway line or a new port, whenever there is a new Greenfield Civil uh, project, it normally is a mega project because of the very same nature of, of infrastructure, right? Uh, probably the thing is that in, in, in many Western countries, uh, basic uh, infrastructure was built uh, decades ago. So we, we all uh, may have forgotten how big and, uh, and these projects are, right? Whether it's a, a new airport or a, a new uh, commuting train line, it's, it's, it's huge by itself. It's a, it, it's a mega project by, by, by itself. Now, if, if I wanna touch on, on the point on how this has, you know, how the mega projects have been evolving in recent years, there are so many things we could touch upon here. Let's, I, I would list, some drivers that, that affect, of course, the trends for, for mega projects. Uh, for example, of course, the, the, the demography trends of, of that country, uh, the, the global urbanization uh, connected with, uh, with you know, regional mobility and, or, and infrastructure strategies, uh, you know, the pan market policies that can also uh, promote, uh, uh, you know, a boom of infrastructure, for example, in the European Union, whenever, whenever European funds are prioritized in this or that country, specifically for infrastructure, then of course you end up with large infrastructure plants and mega projects in, in, in those markets. 
there are global trends that are of, of course affecting uh, infrastructure needs for example the expansion of the aviation and and, and the shipping industry uh, you know related to to global commerce that also requires you know larger ports larger airports and of course, the um, you touched uh, some of you touched upon technology. Of course, uh, better technology and more developed construction methods uh, also allow for for faster implementation of these mega projects. And this might be as well something that, that facilitates the the uh, the idea of, of of putting mega projects out to the to the market. For example, the 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 wide use of tunneling boring machines since the 1990s have allowed for for a much faster expansion of the mid of the city metro networks right uh, 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 in europe uh, first and, and 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 today as well in 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 north america right so so for example uh, uh we in, in acciona as, as, as an international contractor that we are we, we've just excavated 20 kilometers of twin tunnels for a commuting train in in oslo in norway in less than four years so the, the, you know the, there is also a, you know there can be a temptation there to 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 think a bigger because technology allows for for a faster execution and, a, and an undertaking of, of larger ideas if you wish um, of course um, uh, another thing to think of is that whenever um, whatever new infrastructure that we build which is a mega project then requires appropriate maintenance and upgrades right to avoid or at least delay the need of, of new mega projects and, and 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 that would be then another driver for the need of a, of, a, of a new mega project so whenever there is there is not a proper continuity in the maintenance or in the upgrades then at some point 50 years later you know all your infrastructure is obsolete you new you need new infrastructure with example of this is for example the collapse of the genoa bridge in italy right in august uh, 2018 that killed uh, 43 people uh, so as, as in the US, much of infrastructure of Italy, for example, was built in the decades of the 60s and the, second, uh, and the 70s. And these days they are facing very important needs of, of new mega projects. And this applies to, to uh, many other countries as well. And finally, to, to, you know, to leave the ground for, for, for more questions, let's touch upon the fact that one thing is a mega project and the size of the whole project, right? Whether it's a, a sub subway line from here to there. And a different thing is um, a large contract, uh, and then this touches upon the delivery method. So, uh, you know, we can build one subway line in one contract, and that might include the seabills, the tunnels, it could include the superstructure, it could even include the rolling stock in one contract. And then there is a mega contract for the supplier, uh, or you can build one subway line in 20 contracts, uh, whether they are split in different stretches uh, for seabills or even in different packages for infrastructure and superstructure and rolling stock. So let's 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 clarify that when we talk about a mega project, we, we, we talked about a mega idea, that it's a mega project for the government, it's a mega project for society and for the administration who manages it, but it may or may not be a mega project for the um, construction company building it, because that really depends on the way you package the project and how you deliver the project. Right. No, that, that's really interesting, um, Antonio, the, the idea that um, what's, what's mega for, you know, for one um, city or one uh, region, you know, maybe, maybe very different than it is for others. I, you know, the, the bridge in Mississippi that I mentioned, you know, $150 million may, may not qualify as a mega project, you know, when compared to the, uh, to the 20 kilometers of um, the twin tunnels that, you, you know, for a, for a transit line in, in, in Oslo, as you just described, um, you know, having completed, um, but certainly, you know, the, the relevance in market that that infrastructure is designed to serve, um, you know, is, is key. And, and I think it is important to note that, uh, you know, that this applies again, although we've, you know, just cited a transportation um, example, it applies across all sectors of, of infrastructure, social um, infrastructure, uh, you know, whether that's housing, um, hospitals, you know, lot, lots of other um, asset types or, or asset classes. Um, so it's it's more than just, and I want to make sure we emphasize more than just bridges, roads, and tunnels, um, you know, that we're applying, um, you know, the, the conversation to today. Um, so Eve, you, you've been involved with a, you know, with a project that, um, you know, that, that fits into the, you know, the evolution of mega projects. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, how that's evolved over, um, 
you know, over time, um, you know, some of the some of the projects in which you've been involved? Sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. And, and thank you. Thank you, Francesca, uh, John and Henri. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here as part of this global conversation. Very, very exciting. Uh, so yes, John, uh, currently I'm overseeing the Penn Station Access Project on behalf of the MTA. And that's a mega project where we're looking to bring Metro North into Penn Station. And as part of that, we'll be uh, uh, building four new stations in the East Bronx, which is a very under, uh, utilized, uh, underserviced community in terms of transportation. Uh, definitely qualifies as a mega project. Um, you know, your basic question here is, is the value of mega projects. And I, I think that that's indisputable. Uh, they are needed for economic reasons, social reasons, but the real challenge, as I see it, the challenge is how to deliver them. The delivery is uh, often under scrutiny, um, time, schedule, how you do things faster, how the quality is better, how you do it cost effectively. Those are very much key uh, to sort of launching and, and promoting mega projects. And I just want to go over a couple of, of points about uh, how you do do this delivery better. And one is um, the careful selection of the project itself. You know, does it check off the uh, impact uh, impacts that it has in terms of, in MTA's case, ridership? Is it going to benefit the riders? Uh, does it deliver resiliency to the system? Is it going to improve the state of good repair? You know, we have legacy projects. Uh, legacy systems that, that definitely need uh, updating and so on. Uh, is it going to have a positive environmental impact? What is the resiliency component? And then social impact. And I just want to mention two projects uh, in, in addition to the Penn Station access. And that's Second Avenue Subway, Second Avenue Subway Phase 1. And we're now promoting Second Avenue Subway Phase 2. Both of those projects have a social equity component, as does the Penn Station access project. Um, in terms of phase two, it's going to be going north up into Harlem and East Harlem and then connect with Metro North. These are projects that are going to uh, definitely revitalize and, and energize uh, northern Manhattan. Likewise with Penn Station access, the East Bronx mentioned before, really doesn't have good access to transportation. Uh, this project will give people the ability to commute not only into Penn Station, but also we've seen a robust uh, demand for reverse commuting up to Connecticut, uh, where people will have access to jobs. So economic benefits. So you know the first point is careful project selection and and how do we how do we do that? Uh, the second is how do you set the project up for success? This gets into the delivery uh, to make sure that the the projects are going to make it through to operations. And uh, one of the first things is front end loading, we're calling it um, a, a sort of an interesting term because it has two, two, uh, two definitions. But the idea is to really think it through ahead of time, to do the studies, to do some scoping very carefully so the project is understood, uh, initial budget estimates, schedule estimates, really set it up for success. Um, the other thing is accountability. Um, MTA has instituted the concept of a uh, CEO, Chief Executive Officer, that's the role I'm playing at Penn Station Access. And uh, accountability and, and is really uh, important when you talk about uh, in governments, in government bureaucracies, uh, and just making sure the project goes through. We're also talking about de-risking the projects at the beginning. Um, stakeholder engagement becomes very important to that end, uh, just to make sure you have the buy-in from your multi headed clients um, is, is critical to the success of the project. So setting up for success. Uh, another thing to touch on is getting to market faster. MTA is looking at design build. We're talking about tailored project delivery. How do you get the project to the market. Uh, one of the things we're doing is we're relying heavily on performance specifications that will then be turned over to the builder. It's very tough in bureaucracies such as MTA where uh, New York City Transit is used to seeing the project all the way through the design bid build uh, scenario. To have them relinquish the project based on performance specs is a big challenge, but it's one that we're undertaking. Um, the purpose of getting out to the market faster is 
how do we use the industry? The market uh, is, and the design bill gives us alternate technical concepts that are you know, out, out of the box thinking that we don't necessarily consider. Uh, they're more in touch with certain material innovations, systems in, in, innovations. So let's get out to the market quickly. And then the last thing that we're, we're also pursuing to try to deliver the projects faster and better and less is being cheaper is to move to a paperless world. And by that, I mean, we're looking to start to employ the 3D, 4D, 5D technologies uh, so that we can advance the projects from the planning through the surveying into the design, into the construction, and most importantly, into operations, uh, and do that in a fashion that you don't even necessarily use paper. Um, we are not there yet. State DOT has done some projects where they are there, which is very impressive. So I think that that's uh, a part of a goal that we, we have. So that's just a uh, an introductory, and I'll turn it back to you, John. So, so that's interesting, though. Um, you know, Eve, you you touched on a couple of things um, that draw directly from the um, the observations and the aspirations that um, that um, Henri described for the global infrastructure hub, and in fact for the G20 countries. You know, picking up on a couple of those, the performance based or outcomes based rather than specification um, driven. Uh, you know, procurements and, and innovation and relying on industry um, to to be able to help ac accelerate the the introduction of and use of um, innovative approaches um, and and technologies. Right. So it's it's both innovating um, the procurement, you know, in the procurement method itself being innovative, you know, in that sense, um, driven by performance or outcome based. That's you know, that that's huge. That's a that that's a dramatic shift in um, in the way that you know government has it, at least here in the U.S. traditionally um, you know been you know been been driven. Um, so that's a that that's a great uh, that's a great step forward um, for us to be able to embrace that you know you know as we uh, as we look ahead. Indeed. And and so you know Antonio does that. Um, translate at all for you know for you was that was that part of what um, what you were able to do in in um, at Asiona in, in Oslo um, was that uh, was innovation you know part of that I mean you mentioned drawing upon you know heavier use of uh, the tunnel boring machines as an example um, you know is, is is there more to that no yeah, yeah definitely um um the uh, the that project uh, the the four line tunnels that was a, an epc type of contract uh, and it was a project where the uh, railway administration of norway decided to actually go internationally and procure everything in english uh seeking precisely for uh european well, in this case european contractors but mainly they were seeking for innovation um, Norway is a country with a, with a very long tradition for drill and blast tunneling, for, for traditional tunneling, if you wish, uh, with the use of, of explosives in hard rock. And, and tunneling machines had not been used in a long, long time. However, there was a, a, a strong and, and brave uh, bet uh, for this project to, uh, to be procured, uh, assuming the use of TBMs. But on the other hand, the contractors during the tender phase had of course the chance to propose uh, to suggest and propose uh, innovations or ATCs are are, are they are uh, called here in the in the US and in this case for example we eventually ended up with a solution with uh, with four tunneling boring machines uh, um, working at the same time and mounted inside a huge uh, cavern underground uh, uh, to then boring northwards to uh, um, boring Northwards, we also implemented uh, um, the you know the, the the extraction with conveyor beds, the use of of, uh, of uh, MSVs, small uh, vehicles for extraction. It's a smaller, very technical things eventually because of course you are always within the the, the frame of a of a preliminary design uh, and some aspects as defined by the client. But the, there is always a, as long as you have some flexibility, there are always things you can implement in order to improve uh, either a schedule or or or, or cost. On the other hand, and this is an, uh, I'm touching, I'm connecting with another thing, which is designs and builds uh, are great, 
uh, but uh, they really have to go, and the use of out of, or out of specifications are great, but they really have to go uh, hand by hand with a very uh, good structure of the, of the commercial terms and to structure that properly. Because the move you move from a traditional procurement process uh, into more innovative uh, delivery models, quality design and builds, PPPs, alliances, uh, but in, in any case, uh, you know, lump sums eventually, not alliances, then the better you need to allocate, uh, you know, the, you, you need to work more on the risk allocation. Uh, right. And, and let, let me finish to touch upon one thing that might be interesting for the audience. Only in December last year, the UK government has just published uh, what they called uh, the construction uh, playbook, which is a series of guidelines uh, and just written uh, for, for their own administrations in order to approach the procurement of infrastructure. Due to the crash of uh, British uh, construction companies in the, last, uh, in the last years, and because of the COVID and the use of infrastructure for the recovery, there is a move in the UK uh, to basically promote and, uh, these guidelines to promote new ways of, of, of procuring infrastructure, uh, uh, looking for uh, you know, more collaborative ways, more innovation, win wins and risk, risk sharing uh, in order to deliver better and deliver faster uh, on these infrastructure projects. Well, and, and, and that's interesting, um, Antonio. We've, we have seen, in addition to the, the playbook that you just described, um, there are, you know, plans, um, you know, at, uh, from a number of governmental entities, um, say in Australia, um, long range um, infrastructure plans. Um, we, we tend to develop those at the sort of at the state transportation level, you know, here in the United States. Um, but nothing that goes quite so far as, you know, even, you know, in Los Angeles, you know, 28 by 28, you know, is a, was the closest I think there is to a, you know, a long range strategic capital infrastructure plan, you know, um, there and, and mostly that's driven uh, or motivated by the, um, you know, by the Olympics um, and, and it supported obviously by the, you know, by the underlying needs that are there on a day over day basis. Um, you know, the MTA had, um, here in New York had just this time last year had just finished um, approving and, uh, you know, embarking upon a, um, a sizable 54 plus billion dollar um, long range capital plan, um, you know, set out over the next five years. Um, so Patrick, maybe you can turn to you and ask, um, you know, what, what factors, you know, have driven the evolution of um, larger and more complex projects and, and specifically taking into, into account the, the idea of, you know, one of the things that Henry had uh, spoken about, and that is um, public and private investment. Um, you know, we, we've been looking at more public-private partnerships um, in variety of forms, you know, here in New York, obviously design build, um, you know, being the, the driver um, for how the city um, agencies would undertake, uh, you know, projects, you know, going forward. Um, you know, is, is, there, is there now a greater appetite for private sector absorbing risk in infrastructure delivery? And has the, has the, the global pandemic changed that at all? Well, thank you, John, and thanks for having me. Um, the one thing I will say is with regard to the appetite uh, for private sector absorbing risk in the infrastructure um, arena is that um, I think, um, I'm not sure I would say there's been a greater um, increase in appetite. I do think that there is a more realistic appetite um, that's how I would probably describe it. And what I mean by that is that seeing how um, the market is evolving and how these projects are being delivered and sort of piggybacking off of what Eve said, I think the market now realizes that in order to deliver on these um, really complicated infrastructure projects and get the returns that they're, uh, the market needs, there has to be a more balance of risk exposure. And that is where the market is going, in my opinion, really looking at how do they um, deliver 
on um, a package that allows for the delivery of these mega projects through the balancing of risks. And they do it through a number of ways or they're looking at doing it through a number of ways. And I think this is actually something that is positive um, when you consider that the, the financial markets now have a lot more, um, I would say, opportunities within the delivery methods, looking at integrated project delivery as a way to balance the risk between um, stakeholders, looking at alternative project delivery methods in order to balance those risks. Um, the real, you know, what I'm noticing is that, you know, at the end of the day, the financial markets need to understand that there is a um, a, a security package that they can be comfortable with in terms of delivering these mega projects, a funding package that they can actually get through that can deliver these um, mega projects, and a contingency package. So balancing the risk to be able to get the financial markets the confidence that they can finance these projects is key. And balancing that risk um, is something that has to be done from my perspective through the, the project delivery methods. And also the terms and conditions, as mentioned, uh, I mean, a lot of these projects now are really being sort of balanced based on what the appetite is for um, absorbing some of these challenging terms and conditions that are out there when you start getting to the billion dollar numbers of these projects. No one wants to take on that type of risk without a balance of the risk. Um, so when you look at um, the, you know, the project that I am I'm currently involved in, uh, obviously Terminal 1, it's a huge project and it's in um, north of um, $2 billion easily. Um, what you're realizing is that there are only a handful of people within the market, even internationally, that can really um, deal with a project of this nature. So you have to come in with thoughtful, innovative, and balanced ways of dealing with um, risk and also terms and conditions. Um, and, and that's how you really approach trying to deliver a project like this. On the, um, on the public side, you're looking at um, cities and states, looking at how they could shift some of their potential risk um, and partner with um, the private sector to be able to balance that risk also. Um, what you're seeing is there's a risk of, um, you know, a lot of focus is now on the political risk that these cities and states have, the reputational risk. Um, that the cities and states don't want to deal with the flight risk. And I mean by flight risk, I'm not talking about airlines, I'm talking about flight from cities. I'm really, I mean, the, a lot of people are leaving cities because they just can't afford um, the cities, um, you know, and, you know, we need to make sure that from a political standpoint and from a public standpoint, we are putting infrastructure in place that keeps their tax base in the city. <laughs> So there's a lot of different risk factors that the um, you know um, cities and are looking at now that they need to balance, and that's why they're looking at moving closer to these um, P3s because, you know, at, at the same time, if you start losing a huge share of your population due to poor infrastructure, due to um, slow delivery of projects, um, and all the other factors, you really start losing your political strength, and um, cities start to dissolve. Um, and the last thing I would really uh, touch on in terms of the pandemic, I do think that um, obviously the pandemic has had a huge impact on um, infrastructure projects. And obviously um, people are starting to rethink how they um, not just deliver infrastructure projects or what the future looks like um, after the pandemic is um, you know, hopefully up over and hopefully soon. I think there is a domestic um, view on what the recovery will look like. And I think domestically things in the US will probably um, come back a lot quicker than international um, you know, um, you know, impact. So I think that um, there will be a recovery. There will be, in my opinion, a spike recovery as a re result of the pandemic from an infrastructure standpoint. And there will be a new appetite to really throw um, money behind projects um, in order to stimulate the economy. So I think the pandemic in some ways from a domestic standpoint will trigger more economic stimulus, more um, focus on large scale projects. And I think they also will look at how they can use this stimulus to actually um, be able to bring more economic equity to cities and states. So I think the pandemic will have that effect domestically and Internationally, it's still, it's still out to um, sort of, uh, you know, we, we still don't know necessarily how that's going to be impacted. 
All right. Well, thank you, Patrick. Um, and and we're going to keep the conversation rolling along. Um, Daniel, thanks for your um, for your patience. Um, you know, as we're as we're working through a number of these points, um, you know, what 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 do you see, or what what could the future of infrastructure project delivery look like? Um, you know, from your perspective, you you've seen a lot of uh, growing pains with the use of um, of many of the approaches. Um, you know, access to funding and financing, um, you know, clearly will be, you know, will be key, you know, to this. Um, and, and so much of that recovery is, you know, the need for that recovery caused by the pandemic, but also, um, you know, maybe deferral of maintenance in the, you know, in the past, uh, you know, that's led to, you know, that that awkward capital replacement strategy of, you know, it's obsolete, therefore, we need to tear it down and replace it. Um, you know, what, what are some of the implications that you see, um, Daniel, uh, you know, geologic or geopolitical um, front, technological, climate change, um, resiliency, um, have, have some thoughts for us there? Thank you, John. Thank you for having me and good morning and good afternoon, actually, depending on where you are, everyone. <laughs> so basically, on your questions, I think I can sort of put them into five statements actually that deal with them. And the first one actually is your point about uh, what are the implications from a geopolitical perspective. So my statement here, that sort of the future of the delivery will remain global, but will be very different. Sort of a typical mega project construction of shareholders and participants from all over the world. I mean, as is the, the example here, construction may often be actually from Spanish from a Spanish company, they are world leaders. Traffic management system may come from Germany. The vehicles may come from an Asian country, from Korea, they can come from Japan. Increasingly, they come actually from China. The finance, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of really, really big, uh, there's a big and growing industry. Uh, it, there's a lot of Canadian pension funds, for instance, where I come from here in Toronto. It's very active all over the world, actually, in providing finance. The same actually is in Australia. In Europe, it's in the Netherlands also quite a bit. And then um, the, the operations, they, typically, they tend to be very local, but they can also be outsourced. MTR in Hong Kong is a great example. They are also busy, actually, in Stockholm. Um, Orchiolis in France is, is another uh, interesting, uh, interesting example. So it's a very global group of, of people that are involved, the participants of a, of, um, of a mega project. But the question is actually if that will also be like that in the future, right? And, and I remember uh, 10 years ago, which is 2011, that at the 10th time it was governor uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger who went to China to see if there was a deal to be made for a California high-speed rail project. I think actually that would be very difficult now, actually. Uh, so, so I think that part really has changed. If you look at the financiers, you will see that Canadian and also European pension funds increasingly have very tight ESG or environmental, social and governments uh, rules actually um, that they require to, to finance anything. And sort of a, a typical mega project staple example actually is our toll roads. You'll see them everywhere. And I believe actually the toll roads will be more and more difficult actually to get financed by those um, uh, pension funds. So, so, so that part will change. So that's my first statement. I think the other one um, is, is really about the outsourcing of project preparation and implementations to professionals. If you look to the most mega projects nowadays, they are done by public authorities. They are the typical project promoters. But the question is like in the US, how many really authorities can and are able to manage these mega projects? Very often these projects are once in a lifetime projects. So people do it once and then they go back to their previous job. Um, the, the case in point here is the Montreal REM light rail project where I worked on, where the city really understood that the last mega project there was their involvement in the subway construction, part of the works of the 1976 uh, Montreal Winter Olympics. So a long time ago. And like a conversation between the mayor and the then president of the local pension fund CDPQ made actually that sort of the, the pension fund then started to to say, well, we develop these projects all over the world and we're happy to take up the challenge. 
And I expect actually early and also sometimes unsolicited involvement of investors, especially investors in many other projects. Uh, but obviously there needs to be a good exit strategy and that may include indeed also compensation and sometimes preferential rights for them. So that's the second point. There will be more outsourcing I expect um, from, from mega projects to external, very often private entities. The third one that I expect actually less focus on financing and more on value for money. I think here, very unfortunately, the world is really divided into rich and poor countries. And for the lucky rich ones, the recovery plans all over the world will provide additional monies for infrastructure project implementation. And in addition, actually lending in most developed countries is cheap. Traditionally, that would limit appetite for more um, alternative delivery and P3 project delivery, where it's a, a very often around private finance. Uh, and many practitioners and scholars like Professor, Professor Ben Flivberg, they have long argued that uh, they, that will result actually in a more poor, quicker preparation and very much like a construction rather than a life cycle uh, approach, which will really lead to disaster uh, in, in, in the scoping of the project and cost overruns in delays and in poor quality. So I believe on, on delivery, the future of delivery for alternative delivery or P3s or PPPs, I use the terms uh, in, in, the same, in the same way, that they really can provide the rigor and the incentives to avert sort of these poor outcomes. What is important here is skin in the game. Um, and, and for, you know, for transit projects that should imply really sort of life cycle performance risk transferred and also some transfer actually of, of ridership risk. Now there will be a whole debate on what would be the perfect balance there and there is no right or wrong, but certainly there needs to be some skin in the game of this. That's my third statement. Uh, if you allow me the fourth statement, and I think it's an important one, is really reform of the public legacy project promoters. Um, project viability, and I mean, this may be difficult here for, I understand it's the faculty of construction, but has less to do actually with design and construction skills and more actually with regula uh, regulation reform and competition. So why is the a subway construction in New York is three times more expensive than it is in London or Paris. And I would urge you to investigate the many articles on the matter. And you will see it has nothing really to do with employment conditions or safer construction working place. Too many promoters have a profound inward looking conservative uh, culture uh, and a consistent underperformance in both the operations and in capital projects. Again, uh, Alternative delivery and P3s can act as, and in very, very often they are actually a tool for reform, but it's really only uh, successful if they can address the issue head on. So, and finally, um, my last statement, if you allow me, is all about technology. And I think that sort of technology is a big disruptor in many ways. Uh, you'll see it here on, the, on transit apps that are impacting already for years overall demand in, in public transit. Conferencing software as we're using now will do even more. But I think, and I think it's also to the, to the points of the other uh, presenters that long-term usage of demand predictability of infrastructure will become less. The case in point are autonomous unmanned vehicles that one day may even fly to uh, your home. How relevant will the, uh, the traditional roads railways, including actually, by the way, I think like new things like Hyperloop um, and airports be when that is possible. And, you know, that may be possible in less than 20 years, which is a typical thing for long-term investment. I think that the future is certainly for alternative and intelligent delivery, uh, but the future may look very different for the type of contracts that are now like typically like 20 to 30 years very fixed service levels and very fixed long-term risk uh, and long-term financing. So I hope this is some ideas actually for our discussion. So, yeah, so Daniel, that, that gets right to the, you know, let, let's pick up on, on one of the points that you introduced there. And that is, you know, the, the length of a contract. You know, there's been a lot of questions in the chat um, and, and in the Q&A about, you know, what defines a mega project, um, you know, and I think relevance, you know, it, 
to to the market that the infrastructure is designed to serve, um, its relative impact, you know, it goes a long way towards, um, you know, helping to understand, you know, what a what a mega project is. It's not, you know, a, a few years ago at the, you know, at the P3 conference circuit, you know, there was lots of discussion of, you know, it, it was a billion dollars, you know, that was the that was the cutoff. Um, and at the same time, the opportunity to engage in, you know, anything from, you know, design, build, gap financing, DBF, you know, and then taking into consideration the operations and maintenance, whether in a, um, in a concession model or, you know, in availability payments for a full on design, build, finance, operate, maintain, you know, you started to, to see the appetite for that, you know, suddenly, you know, if it was only $500 million, it was, you know, it was somehow more readily acceptable. If it was only, you know, you know, a three or $400 million project, you know, those clearly were mega projects in the context of the departments, the agencies that, um, you know, for whom that, uh, that asset was to be developed and delivered. So, but a big part of that also we saw, you know, if you go back to Chicago, um, you know, parking, you know, you're, we've dialed way back from the 99 year contract period, you know, and, you know, and now if you're in the 30 to 40 year period, you're starting to talk about and really take into consideration most of the life cycle, you know, of that asset. And yet we then turn around and deliver, you know, bridges, um, you know, using the cable stay design here, one in New York City, the other just outside of New York City, you know, that are touted as 100 year design bridges. So this this will go in and Antonio be interested in your thoughts on this as well. You know, is a mega project defined by that mega contract? Is that based on the the dollar value of the proposed um, contract? Is it the timeline? Is it the length of service? What what are some thoughts there then? And how does that impact, you know, what we, you know, what we talk about relative to the delivery of planning for and delivery of that? So Daniel, you first and then Antonio be interested in your thoughts. Thank you, John. I mean, obviously the size and the, the sort of the $1 billion is not the only the only part actually of being a mega project. I think, as I think, as you mentioned, sort of complexity is a very important one. This comes also back to the issue about risk allocation, which is really crucial, but complexity is clear. Uh, yes, most infrastructure, and this is what you refer to as well, most infrastructure is really built for a lifetime, right? Um, and, and, but then the question is indeed, with the, the future and the uncertainties about technology, how does that impact this, right? You mentioned actually sort of parking, uh, and whereas indeed sort of until pretty recently, you could have these long-term concessions about parking space. Parking is one of those things that people are questioning. Will there be actually the same need for parking in 20 or 30 years? Again, with autonomous vehicles, you can park them way you know, outside of the city actually. So you don't need actually expensive parking inside the city as an example of that. That impacts obviously the appetite for investors to invest in the project, especially in coming back to the point of, of, of risk allocation. If, if they are able to, you know, if they assume any of that uh, revenue risk there. So there is a, there's a couple of issues that are really related to, to, to the issue uh, and complexity and risk allocation in my view are pretty crucial to it. Because if it's on price, yes, some places, and again, like New York, everybody, everything would be a mega project because it's very expensive. Uh, but it's not necessarily always like that. It needs to also be very complex long-term um, and obviously, in my view, also really with a life cycle approach. Antonio? I think to me, um, the concept of mega project is very much defined by, why, by what Daniel mentioned in, the first, uh, in his first intervention, which is the, the singularity, the, the one-off idea of the project. Normally, that goes with size. Um, but um, but I think it, yeah, it also goes with the fact that the, the, the need is not there that often, huh? uh, but it's still there, and I that, that's why uh, and I, I'll, I'll mention some mega projects that for us are mega projects, and they are delivered in many different ways. And sometimes uh, we are building things that we thought that maybe shouldn't be. Some people might think uh, uh, are not being built anymore. We, right now, for example, uh, in Acciona, we are building the largest dam in Canada, in northern British Columbia. 
dams are very, very rare these days. People say, you know, we don't need reservoirs anymore. Well, population keeps growing. The climate is changing at some point. We're going to need maybe a new dam somewhere. We're going to need uh, a, a new bridge somewhere, even though the patterns of mobility change. We are building a uh, cable estate bridge in Vancouver right now uh, in, in design phase. Uh, but again, uh, that is, you know, there is a replacement need. Uh, the mega project will be there always. Construction is probably the oldest industry uh, in the world. And as long as population is there and keeps changing, there will be a need for a mega project. Maybe the definition will change. Another example, Daniel was talking about the, you know, how technology is changing the need for parking lots or, uh, or even a subway. Or, um, but um, even if at some point we decide to redefine a city, you will have to build a new city. And there are examples, for example, very interesting examples in Saudi Arabia right now, uh, Neom, Neom City being one of them, where uh, there, there, are, there are rethinking how a city uh, might be starting from scratch. So, so uh, you know, uh, not that long ago, Indonesia was announcing a new capital uh, that will substitute Jakarta. Uh, so we might see new Brasilias uh, again uh, in a decade because we want to maybe redesign a city that, it's, that really fits more to, you know, the, 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 how we use technology and how mobility is changing. But then the mega project will be maybe a new urban development, right? Or a specific in, or, or an electrical motorway because, you know, cars are completely different. So to finalize, I think mega project is very much connected, uh, not only with the size, but the, with the complexity that implies the one-off thing. Uh, and again, I think the, the biggest challenge is that because they, uh, unless they are recurrent, uh, Daniel mentioned it very well, people facing managing these projects, whether from the public side uh, or uh, yeah, normally from the, from the owner's side, uh, do, do not face these projects normally. And, and this is why many, many times we see it in many, many different countries. Uh, they are very challenging, but of course, uh, if you don't do them very often, then the problems arise, problems and difficulties of any kind. Um, right. So that that's that's interesting, Antonio, and and that that brings to mind a question, um, Eve, to to turn back to you a little bit. The the approach that um, that the MTA is taking and the project in which you're involved, um, you know, is is looking to extract value, sort of mid mid course, um, right? I mean, going back and and taking the existing asset. Um, and and looking for ways to be able to increase the value. Um, I think you described one of those criteria as, um, you know, the, to, to the ridership, um, you know, the re-energizing um, stations um, for both reverse commute um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and the interstitial um, stops in the Bronx. Can you describe a little bit about what 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 motivated that? What was the? I mean, it's not the, the life cycle of the you know of a of a service contract that we're talking about here. What what was it that um, the brought brought about the MTA's um, you know thinking for that? So uh, a couple of things before I address that question, I do just want to say in terms of the mega projects, uh, uh, an additional criteria in terms of complexity would be stakeholders, just the multi-headed stakeholders. And I I do want to just say as an aside. Um, that Patrick and I are uh, uh, exploring that, that concept and uh, I'll give an unabashed uh, uh, shout out for the course that we're gonna teach in the fall where we're gonna really explore what a mega project is and, and we're starting to uh, you know, study those definitions. Um, and you know, I think it's all of the above. I think it's the life cycle, it's the length, it's the cost, it's the stakeholders. So you know, um, please join us in the fall if you're interested in this topic. Uh, but but going to your your question, you know, it, it, it's multi pronged um, value. Uh, the value to the communities is is phenomenal. You know, typically you go with a project like this that uh, is does have some level of disruption. This one's going to be less so because we're working on Amtrak's existing right away the Hellgate line. So there's already a line. So this is a clever project because it's it's leveraging. Uh, on, a, on an asset that's already in place. And what we're gonna do is add these four stations. So when we go to the community, we don't get the, uh, the, the usual commentary of not in my backyard, we get when, when is it gonna happen? We're, we're eager for it. Um, and in terms of the value, um, we're developers already 
hopping on board and they're speculating on the uh, uh, the coming of these projects. And, you know, incidentally, at, at this point, funding is in jeopardy for this particular project. We're hoping that with the new administration, uh, there'll be an impetus for this. But we're already seeing uh, developers interested in this area and, you know, going back to the P3 or the public private participation is how do we capture the value? Like, in other words, the developers are perfectly happy to build and, and get all sorts of money for the fact that they speculated, but how do we fund the project? How do we capture that value? And, you know, one of the thoughts is the, the number seven extension uh, project, which used the Hudson Yards, which is a whole new, mo whole different model, but, you know, how do you engage the private sector, how do you incentivize them? How do you capture that value? It, it, it's really interesting. And, and it gets, it, it draws the question, um, you know, of the, you know, an earlier point that was raised about the number of, of um, private sector firms who can engage, you know, at, at, at these levels that we're talking about. Um, while Patrick's involved with, you know, new terminal one at, uh, at Kennedy, you know, at LaGuardia, there there are two projects, in, you know, going on there. Um, you know, one the LaGuardia Gateway Partners, um, Skansco, Walsh, um, Meridium, amongst others, um, and then you know, and then Delta Airlines and and what they're doing. Each of those projects, one I think is a four point two billion dollar project. The other is a three point nine billion dollar project. Um, it's incredible to think about, you know, projects at, at that scale. And it, so that's in essence two mega projects in one airport. And that airport's dwarfed by the airport where Patrick's working on, um, you know, in the in the context of new Terminal One. Um, it, is is there a fear um, of whether or not there are enough private contractors um, who are capable of being able to participate in in these projects? And is that really a question about um, access to to financing more than um, you know more than contractors? Patrick, maybe I'll start with you on that, and then we can circle through, let each of the panelists take a take a shot at that. Yeah, I mean, the way I would describe it from my perspective is, um, yes, that fear was there. I think that's something that's solvable. I think that when you look at these projects from an economic um, stimulus standpoint, the risk of um, being able to not find um, credible um, large-scale um, contractors and builders um, that have the balance sheet to, to do these projects is certainly there. But if you design these projects from a political standpoint to be economic stimulus, there's ways you can break them up in a way that you can get a mega project delivered while being able to create opportunities for smaller builders, smaller designers within that project. And I think that's the direction that uh, we have to go. It really is how you design the delivery method, how you look at the economics of it, and how you do the financing of the project to be able to um, benefit um, all, you know, all involved. That obviously makes the project even more complicated, but I think at the end of the day, um, using mega projects as economic stimulus um, is the way that both the public um, and the private sector recognizes they're probably going to have to be adapting to. Um, so yes, it is a challenge. It is a problem. Not many people have the balance sheet to do a six billion dollar project on their own. But at the same time, if you frame it and break it up accordingly, you can really put, drive economic um, benefits across the board. Okay, that's interesting. Daniel, um, any thoughts about that from what you've seen elsewhere? Yeah, well, I, I think first of all, from a project promoter perspective, your key concern is really that there is competition. So indeed, you need to really carefully check indeed if there's enough market and appetite in there uh, to deal with this. Um, I mean, on, on the issue that, you know, if it's a $6 billion uh, project, Indeed, you can slice it up, but it's really about the way that you do your payment mechanism, right? I mean, you can have parts being paid during the construction. Uh, in, I mean, it's, these are all options there actually to ensure that there is sufficient competition. And as I was mentioning in my earlier points that you have some skin in the game. I think it's important that always there is skin in the game that if indeed if there's underperformance that there is something actually that there is a penalty for those, for those entities involved. And, and so that drives really the accountability uh, point um, that Eve raised earlier, right? That's a, you know, that's a, that's a big part of it. Um, 
Um, so, an Antonio, as as one of those uh, as one of those participants in a you know in a number of P3s um, and and a variety of flavors of those, um, you know, as you've noted, not not all you know straight concession models. Um, do you, do you see um, you know risks going forward of the you know of of the use of more or access to more private financing, um, you know, that, that gets right to one of the key points that um, Henri had mentioned, um, you know, for the global infrastructure hub, you know, in the advice that they're providing back to the G20. Do you, do you see that as a uh, as big challenge? No, actually, we, we, uh, uh, um, we as developers, Acuna is also a developer. We, we, uh, we've been developed more than almost 45 projects in the last uh, 30 or 35 years. We are top 15 infrastructure developer uh, uh, globally. And we are always in the seek for new projects to be developed. Uh, we have a permanent, permanent interest in, in finding um, good projects where we can also be a developer, whether it's a pure concession or, or any type of, of P3. Uh, the question is, and, the, and, and we are in an industrial organization, but we also know that for pure financial investors that there is the interest is, is clearly there. Uh, uh, but of course, of course, um, projects need to be framed uh, and structured in a way that they that they uh, that they drag the, the, the they are they they drag the appetite the appetite right from 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 the private uh, from the private uh, party. So um, I would say, yeah. Um, if uh, th there is, I think that this is where the GI Hub activity is is so crucial. There is potential uh, investment. There is a, a lot of interest, uh, and there are still many credible contactors who are able to to raise financing. Uh, of course, maybe not for eight billion dollar projects, but as someone has mentioned, you can always, you know. Uh, um, break them into uh, into smaller, uh, you know, more 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 accessible uh, uh, one, two, three billion dollar packages. Uh, um, so, but on the other hand, the the problem is that uh, we always see across the different many many countries that um, it's a huge challenge eventually to be able uh, to uh, to to uh, settle a regulation. Uh, for for those two parties, private and public, to collaborate together, we we, we entered Canada almost twenty years ago. We've developed five PPPs in in Canada, but even even Canada, who has been and Daniel knows it better than me, one of the most active PPP markets in the world. Uh, at some point, they are lately changing uh, or discussing other alternative uh, models because uh, of the risks implied for the private party and, and, and also huge, huge crashes and, and very bad financial results on the private side, and as well as uh, uh, scandals on the public side because of delays and so on. So I think the main challenge is still, you know, how you procure these. And I, the only answer to that is continuity. I think you really need a long-term will from an administrations to uh, do something in a continuous manner and keep developing and improving whatever procurement model is agreed for those types of projects. The one-off thing here and there is, is very difficult. There are still examples, and let me finish because it's quite unique. We are just finishing off line one of um, Quito Metro in, in Ecuador, in, in Latin America. That is a mega project because it's a 2.5 billion euro metro line, uh, fully uh, um, built by us, but still a build only contract. And it's been a success in terms of a schedule and time because there was, a, uh, there was a, an administration there that really was uh, was open to um, somebody mentioned you know more outsourcing more outsourcing so the idea there was okay let's bring in the, the consultants uh, uh, to copy basically copy Madrid Metro solution uh, so there is a there is a, a very well developed detailed design on the client side uh, a lot of financial investors uh, were engaged because obviously Ecuador didn't have the money so there is participation for a lot of um, uh, uh, institutional investors, the European uh, Bank of, uh, of Investment, uh, CAF, uh, a lot of multilateral agencies, all that together eventually has, has worked out into a project that is, uh, is now in the testing and commissioning phase uh, after three, three and a half years, and it's a 22 kilometer metro line. So it, 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 it's really interesting. Um, the, 
the point you raise here, Antonio, and I think reinforced by a number of observations, um, from Daniel, from um, Patrick, and from Eve, the the idea of um, of mega projects and the more collaborative, um, innovative project delivery methods, um, you know, that are you know that are emerging. And by it, it's not that they're so new; it's really a matter of it, it's more the emergence of the of the use and applicability of the um, innovative project delivery methods. Um, really is changing the nature of the owner, the governmental entity in, in most public works cases that we're, you know, that we're referring to. And again, this applies whether it's a hospital or, um, you know, or a courthouse, um, a toll road or a, you know, or a seaport or an airport for that matter. Um, it changes the, the nature of the procuring agency. You know, if you go to break down a mega project, you know, in the case of Maryland's, um, you know, Re trying to toll the beltway and, and the surrounding, you know, road network, you know, it, you really have to break that down from what could have been an eight to 10 plus billion dollar project into more manageable projects, even though they are, you know, of scale. Um, and, and, and so the procurement agency then becomes the manager of that complexity. And that's a, that's a different kind of a role. That's certainly the case with MTA, you know, that $54 billion, um, you know, over the next, you know, five years, um, you know, and, and Eve, certainly it's the case that, um, you know, breaking that down, you know, the new organizational structure that has, you know, the uh, transparency and accountability, um, you know, and, and value driven, you know, delivery, you know, Given the given the nature of the CEO role, you know, for you know, in essence, for delivery of each of those projects, um, really has changed um, in many respects um, what should be of interest to the G20 um, members and their, um, you know, and and the agencies, you know, within each of their respective, um, you know, countries on the delivery of. Um, you know, of mega projects. And, and again, mega being defined as what's relevant, you know, in irrelevant terms, you know, it's so complex as to draw the, the lion's share of attention of an agency, you know, and, and focus specifically on that. Not unlike what Patrick is dealing with, um, you know, on behalf of the, uh, you know, of the, of the Port Authority and all of the travelers, you know, who, who come through JFK. Um, it, it, it's remarkable to, uh, to look at. So, if, if I could summarize quickly, then the, um, and we tried to draw in a number of questions that were posed by, uh, by the audience. Thanks everyone for sticking around um, for this discussion from around the world. Um, innovation, value, and, and outcomes are all a, a very different lens to, um, to apply to the procurement of and management of the delivery of, uh, of infrastructure. Again, at a wide range of scales across a diverse range of asset types or asset classes, I think it's very clear that innovative and creative speed, they're all fundamentally, to look at through those lenses um, is fundamentally changing the way uh, projects as complex and as large as what we've defined as, as we've discussed as mega projects. Um, changing the way that they're being planned and being procured um, and then management of the delivery of those, taking into account the life cycle is a remarkably different um, perspective to offer. Um, and I think that going forward um, across all of the member um, countries of the G20, across all of the economies um, throughout, I, I think is, um, you know, has, has fundamentally shifted the way that we'll at least look at planning um, for and certainly delivering um, infrastructure uh, moving forward. So thanks everyone for uh, for your um, engaging in this conversation today. Um, what we hope to be um, the first of uh, of many going forward. Um, thanks again to um, Francisco and um, and to Henry um, for your conversation to to tee this up. Um, thank you, Patrick and Daniel, um, Antonio and Eve um, for your uh, for your participation today. Um, best of luck to everyone in uh, 2021 as it unfolds.